this discussion forum with the deanery. Um, I, I'll remind everyone that this session will be recorded and uh, we will be posting it uh, for you know people who might want to um, refer to it later on. Um, today, I'm really happy that we have um, um, several uh, um, vice deans and heads of departments um, who will tell us a bit more about the PhD programs in each of their different uh, faculties and schools. Uh, with us today, we have um, Associate Professor Bruce Lockhart, who will be representing FASS, that's the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. We have Professor David Reeb, who will be, uh, who is the head of Department of Accounting and who will be representing the NUS Business School. We have um, Associate Professor Rudy Stouffs, Stouffs sorry, um, who um, is from the Department of Architecture, um, and Professor Dam Damian Chalmers uh, from the Faculty of Law, and uh, Associate Professor Susanna uh, Kadir, who is from the uh, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. So um, I think the way we'll do this is that each um, of the vice deans uh, will talk a little bit about the uh, PhD program in their respective schools for about you know five to ten minutes, give or take. And um, after that, we'll pretty much just keep this fairly informal and open the floor to questions and answers. Uh, there are two ways that you can do this. You can either type questions, you know, as they come to your mind in the in the chat box, and I can help to consolidate some of these questions. Um, or, um, which is something I would highly recommend uh, at the point when we open the uh, discussion to the floor, uh, just feel free to use the raise hand function um, in the chat box and, um, and, and I will uh, un unmute you and also uh, so that you can ask your question in person. So I think with that, um, I'll turn the floor over to um, Bruce um, to tell us a bit more about the FASS program. Okay, thank you. I'm going to just do, share screen. is it uh, visible? Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, very glad to be here with you all. I can't see anyone there except my colleagues here, but I know there are people out there. So uh, we certainly want to give you a warm virtual welcome to Singapore. Uh, I'm going to talk just a bit about uh, the programs in Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, uh, the way we are structured, essentially everything that would be committed, considered as humanities and social sciences are all in our faculty. And we actually have a sort of informal three-way division between humanities, social sciences, and Asian studies, which is almost unique, I think, to, uh, to NUS. This is because essentially, as most people will know, uh, Asian studies is a core part of our, uh, of our curriculum. And in fact, I think particularly at the PhD level, I would say probably roughly three quarters two of our PhD students are working on some topic that is related to Asia because it's really our major strength. So I'm just going to briefly uh, just run through these and not even read all of them. I would just uh, mention, I'm going to just mention a couple of points that may not be uh, completely obvious if you are looking at uh, our website. So uh, we have one, our anthropology and sociology are in a single department, and the department is called sociology. But within that department, you can do either anthropology or sociology. There are colleagues trained in both fields. Uh, we have, and then it's similar for English language, English literature, theater studies. They're also within one single department that's English language and literature. Uh, then, as I mentioned just now, we have a number of specialized departments in Asia, probably more specialized Asian studies departments than any other university. So our sort of regional studies, area studies would be Chinese, Japanese, Malay, South Asian, Southeast Asian. And then uh, we have a two PhD only programs, the cultural studies in Asia and comparative Asian studies. These programs have no uh, corresponding undergraduate equivalent, but uh, they are PhD only and they use the faculty from the other departments. Cultural studies in Asia is for students who are obviously interested in cultural studies, uh, whereas comparative Asian studies, generally speaking, are students from uh, any one of these disciplines. And the main point is to be comparing two different regions of Asia, and generally speaking, using two different uh, Asian languages in your studies. Just very briefly for time frame for PhD, generally speaking, four years to five years. Our coursework requirement varies from department to department. The minimum would be six, the maximum would be 13. Different departments have different standards for the coursework they want from their students. If you're thinking of masters by research, because all of our uh, programs, except for cultural studies and comparative Asian studies, do have masters by research, particularly good choice if you are uh, thinking of a PhD 
but we're not sure about it yet. Uh, so there can be anywhere from four to nine modules, uh, two to three years along with the thesis. Just a brief word about coursework programs, although here we are mainly, uh, of course, talking about PhDs. We have a very, very wide variety of coursework programs with new programs uh, coming on board all the time. So we have, uh, again, our, our, uh, our, ex our main expertise is in many ways in Asia, various aspects, but particularly if you are interested in doing fields like economics, philosophy, psychology, where obviously there are plenty of topics uh, out there to be worked on, which are not specifically Asian, then this is also a great place to come. And we'd be very pleased to have you. With that, I will stop and let my turn over to my colleagues. Thanks, Bruce. Um, I, I believe um, uh, uh, David is next, um, who will tell us a bit more about the uh, programs in the business school. Hello, everyone. My name is David Reed. I'm in the business school. I, uh, um, I'm also the director of the PhD program. So I want to talk a little bit about both the PhD program and then a little bit about the master's program in the business school. So the business school is really focused heavily on research, um, and most of the faculty hold doctorates from arguably the top schools in the country or in the world in terms of research and routinely publish in the top journals across each of the disciplines in the business school. Each area or each of the departments in the business school, accounting, analytics and operations, finance, management, organization, marketing and strategy and policy, have both a PhD program and master's programs. The master's programs are typically master's programs um, based on coursework, and they usually have a heavy um, analytics component to them. The, we have a very strong analytics and operations department that does a lot of work also with industrial engineering and applied statistics. And so that permeates throughout the master's programs and the PhD programs in the business school. So when we think about what our mission is in the business school in terms of the PhD program, for instance, it's really about training future members, faculty members who can go to reputable institutions around the world who can engage in both research and teaching scholarship. So what does a typical PhD program look like? I know when I started the PhD program, I had a master's degree and I sort of knew what a master's degree was because it looked a lot like a bachelor's degree, but the PhD looked nothing like that. So let me just talk a little bit about how the PhD program is set up. Business PhD program um, is effectively an applied social science degree. It brings in aspects from our component, our building blocks from econ, sociology, psychology, applied math, and statistics. And so as a result, what you end up seeing, depending on the department it's in, there's going to be two or three courses on theory building or on, on theory from either econ, sociology, or psychology for the most part. Then there's going to be two or three or four courses on research methods. And this could be anywhere from field experiments to um, econometrics to some sort of other applied statistics. And then each department runs seminar specifics to their department that are very topic oriented, institutional detail about accounting or institutional detail about management and organization. And so the coursework typically takes the first couple of years of the program. Then after this is done, one takes a qualifying exam and then ultimately writes a dissertation. And the dissertation is where one does their own research. In the business school, this typically comprises three separate research projects that are bundled together to make the dissertation. And so it's sort of a learning process. You start the first one and you finish it, and then you start a second one, and hopefully get a little bit better. And by the third one, hopefully you're, you know, you've gotten pretty good at actually engaging in research. The facilities, the PhD students all get an office, the master's program, we are in the process of um, refurbishing a building with new um, uh, module pod places for people to, uh, for master's students to engage in projects and to do work because a lot of the master's program stuff is focused on 
um, team projects. And so they have that space. The PhD students all get an office and then they get access to different databases, the computing center and so forth. And what you observe in both the master's program and the PhD program is that there is a substantial cohort effect. The programs are small, for instance, like the PhD program might let in 10 or 12 students a year across the various disciplines. And so these cohorts not only learn and learn from each other during their time here at NUS, but those relationships carry forward going on into the future. For instance, I still carry on with the people that I went to the PhD program with many years ago. And that's the kind of things that you observe for both our master's and our PhD program. In terms of placements, the business school is fairly successful in placing their graduates in schools around the world, anywhere from places in Australia, like Monash, to here in Singapore and NTU, to in the US, to say Kansas State, to Hong Kong, and so forth, China and various places around the world. So we have a complete list of that if you're interested in, in that aspect of it. But the ultimate idea behind the PhD program is placement at a research university. So if to give you a kind of a closing aspect of it, when I think about the PhD program, it's about focusing on the tools and the skills to do cutting edge research. And the master's program is more about utilizing the tools to solve real business problems. In the program, whether it's the master's or the PhD, you really learn to be independent, to work in teams and to, to really develop and challenge yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, uh, next up, we have um, uh, Associate Professor Rudy Stoops, who will tell us about the uh, program and architecture. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's fine. Um, so I'm Rudy Stux. I'm a deputy head of research in the Department of Architecture, but I will talk more broadly about the um, PhD research at the School for Design and Environment. The School of Design and Environment contains two departments, architecture and the built environment, and one division of industrial design. And at the school, we, um, PhD students and in general, they're both STEM and uh, non-STEM research, as well as a lot of interdisciplinary research. Um, we are you know, basically in between um, social sciences and um, engineering um, and, and, and science. The, the PhD by research program of the Division of Industrial Design is uh, Singapore's only PhD program in industrial design. And it focuses on emerging design research areas such as um, user experience design and service design, medical design and additive, additive manufacturing, and uh, creative interaction design. It's one of the smallest PhD programs in NUS, but um, not, you know, not the least. And um, it has also a lot of research through industry collaboration. And you can see some of the um, images from. Um, research being conducted by uh, PhD students. The um, department of the built environment is um, a much larger um, department and it uh, has four research clusters. One is on project management and digital construction. Another one on project finance and construction law. The third one on building energy efficiency and indoor environmental quality. And the last one on sustainable buildings and materials. It uses advanced technologies that link throughout the research clusters and um, also does a lot of integrated and cross-disciplinary um, research across these um, clusters. Its research is uh, embedded in the urban solutions and sustainability domains and the smart nation and digital economy domains of um, Singapore. And um, just some information about um, increasing um, research grants and also increasing number of um, research students in the Department of the Built Environment. 
It has three research centers, one of the, a center for um, 5G digital building technology, a center for integrated building energy and sustainability in the tropics, and a center for project and facilities management, as well as a few um, laboratories on project management and digital construction, sustainable buildings, and building energy efficiency. And you can find more information about um, ongoing research at, on the website of the Department of Built Environment, as well as on the um, research programs, PhD and um, Masters by Research, as well as other uh, programs. If you have further inquiries specifically relating to the Department of Built Environment, please email uh, nelsonc at nus.edu.sg. In the Department of Architecture, we also have a number of different research clusters uh, focusing on uh, history, theory, and criticism, technologies, urbanism, landscape studies, and research by design. History, theory, and criticism, among others, focuses on architectural representation, colonial, post-colonial built environment, modern, postmodern architecture in Asia, heritage conservation and cultural heritage. In the technologies research clusters, we have the um, Tropical Technologies Laboratory um, shown in the background, as well as research in the areas of architectural and urban prototyping, urban climate design, urban analytics, design automation and um, soundscapes. And one example um, from the Urban Climate Design Lab um, led by uh, Dr. Yuan Shao, in which the, um, in the background of climate change and increasing urbanization, they conduct research to support and aspire toward climate sensitive planning and design for sustainable and resilient cities in real life. Ur in urbanism, focusing on um, aging and healthcare, conservation and regeneration, community and participation, urban form and big data, and resilience and informality. And again, I will just provide a few examples. Um, in aging and healthcare, uh, topics are among others, high density urban environments for aging, design for health and well-being, and long-term care and health supportive environments. And this is one uh, example of a, a PhD study on aging in place and the older worker. And in conservation and regeneration, uh, topics are, among others, urban history and morphology of Asian cities, urban and rural regeneration in Asia, and heritage conservation and heritage management. And again, an example, a PhD student on um, cultural rhizome, analyzing assemblage pattern of creative placemaking in two communities in China. There are also, um, but I won't uh, read them all, um, more information about um, community and participation, urban form and big data and resilience and informality. In the landscape studies cluster, um, topics cover the breadth from um, ecological to the social um, or the whole spectrum and also differ in the scale of interest, both from the plot to um, all the way to the city. Um, topics can be um, relating to landscape planning for ecological connectivity, landscape pattern function relationships, urban agriculture, uh, biophysical and biogeochemical processes in landscapes, um, and relating to human nature relationships, landscapes and health, landscapes and pro-environmental behavior, landscapes and social capital, and spatial equity. And finally, And I hope you can hear the sound. No, not yet. In um, research by design. I see the PhD by design as a critical space that produces its own types of research, specific to how it allows for thinking through making by introspecting and developing upon the working processes methods and tools and modes of thinking utilized in the field of design. In this space of thinking through the task of design, I am given the opportunities to build upon existing knowledges and skills, not only on the scale of the discipline, but on a personal level 
where I could advance my interest in drawing and articulate how it is central in the ways that I think about, make and teach design. I could ask how is drawing implicative to knowledge making and why should students and practitioners continue to draw and in what ways. I hence see this PhD trajectory as part of my larger design education and profession. Before I had embarked on this endeavour, I had worked in architecture firms and taught in architecture and design schools after graduating with a master's degree in architecture. I had even started my own design practice, but only to end up wanting to know more. What ideas would I stand for? What design thoughts mattered most to me? How could I develop these in academia and bring it back to practice? Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Rudy. Um, so next up, we have um, uh, Professor Damon Chalmers who will tell us more about the uh, programs in law. Uh, go, good morning, everyone. Um, in the next five minutes, I'm just going to spend a little bit of time telling you a little bit about the faculty, a little bit about the program, and uh, a little bit about what we expect from you if you decide to choose to come to uh, do a PhD here in, at NUS in the law faculty. So first of all, why, why bother coming to NUS Law? Well, we would suggest four reasons. Firstly, we perhaps somewhat immodestly, I think we're quite good. Uh, we're currently 10th in the QS rankings. We've risen from 22nd in the last decade, which is a faster um, ascent than almost any other uh, law faculty in the world. And we've been able to recruit quite aggressively people from really quite uh, significant peers around the world. Secondly, a bit like uh, the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, we have a strong expertise, particularly here in Asia. We have an unrivaled range of expertise in different jurisdictions. I mentioned Asian jurisdictions, China, India, Japan, among others, we're always expanding that. The third thing that we think we offer is that we're meeting pace for researchers, possibly uh, quite unique amongst uh, world law faculties. We have a high number of visitors, both short term and medium term from around the world. And it's not just we have a high number, they really do come from around the world, from East, West in particular. And finally, we think we have quite a strong, uh, vibrant research community. We have seven research centers. You can see they do commerce, finance, environment, legal theory, Asian legal studies, uh, maritime law, technology, that includes AI and robotics in the law as well. And we've just set up a new sort of working group in private law. So those are reasons what we think we might be quite interesting. But that might be about us, but what, what about you? What would be interesting to do a doctorate here at NUS? Well, we think we offer four things to you. Firstly, we promise supervision. Depending on your thesis, you will have either one or two supervisors, so to depend on the subject matter and your own choices. You will have to typically prepare work for them every five to six weeks. So there'll be regular meetings. Each meeting will involve you discussing your research with them. Second, we offer quite extensive research training. The first year is really dedicated very heavily to research training. You will present your work. In addition, we have training on research methods and legal approaches to scholarship. Third, compared to our peers, we offer, we think, quite generous financial support, not just in terms of stipends and fees, but in terms of allowing you, hopefully when the COVID is over, to go around the world, meet people, present your research, do field work. And finally, we think our doctoral students have an interesting research community. You'll have your own room, you'll have your own doctoral uh, 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 research workshop where you'll present your work to each other, and you're fully integrated members of our research community. We really hope and expect that you come to all our research events. Now, finally, if you do choose to come and do a doctorate here at NUS in the law faculty, what do we expect of you? 
Well, you'll have regular meetings and you must prepare for those. Secondly, we expect you to attend and pass research training and doctoral research workshops to be strong, uh, robustly trained legal researchers. Thirdly, after about 15 months, we use an acronym, this is really an upgrade system called the DCQE. We will ask you to present your research question, your research uh, uh, statement, and a draft chapter to see if you're on the way to successfully uh, completing a PhD. We will, we will also expect consistent progress from you for each of the four years of the PhD program where you will be here. Finally, at the end, you will do a, pass an oral examination on an 80,000 word piece of original research. We use a book approach to PhDs. It's one, sig one significant extensive piece of work with the idea that it will afterwards be a monograph rather than a series of articles. In terms of overall work we expect of you, typically a PhD is about 10,000 hours across the four years. So 40 to 50 hours per week, 48 weeks a year. But those 40 to 50, week, 40, 40, 50 hours, there's not just nine to five. Those are hours that involve you working and researching. They don't include time for breaks. It's a highly demanding project of PhD. About, we accept about one in 20 applicants. And whilst we hope very much you will apply to uh, the Faculty of Law uh, at NUS, we also hope you will think a little bit about whether PhDs for you, because it is challenging, it is demanding, and that's why people that get PhDs are uh, justly recognised. I will stop there, and I hope you enjoy the, the rest of the day. Thanks very much, Damien. Um, uh, last but certainly not the least, uh, we have Prof uh, Professor Susanna Kadir, who will tell us more about the programs in the uh, LKY School of Public Policy. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Susanna. Uh, I'm currently Vice Dean Academic Affairs at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. I am not going to be speaking with slides uh, and uh, really uh, spend the next uh, five minutes uh, talking very uh, generally about the PhD program and also uh, a little bit about the master's programs that we have. We are a graduate school, so the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy only has graduate programs. We are located uh, adjacent to the law school on the Bukit Timah campus. Uh, we've been a school uh, that's been in place uh, since 2005, uh, and uh, the PhD program uh, is uh, fairly small and uh, relatively uh, new. Uh, I'm going to talk really very quickly about uh, the curriculum, the structure, tell you a little bit about the placement uh, and how uh, we're developing the PhD program very much linked to our research centers um, as well. Uh, the mission of the school is really about developing uh, thought leaders uh, that uh, encompasses both the PhD program as well as the master's program. Uh, we are developing leaders within Asia with analytical skills, substantive knowledge, uh, and basically able to conduct uh, in-depth research in uh, public policy. Uh, the PhD program is the one that emphasizes the research dimension uh, extensively. Um, it essentially is focused on training uh, candidates to pursue positions primarily in academic institutions, so other universities, uh, but also in international organizations and NGOs, but only a very small percentage uh, move on to uh, work uh, in these organizations. Uh, the most of our PhD graduates uh, actually continue with an academic uh, career. The core, the PhD program in terms of curriculum design uh, is uh, meant to be relatively uh, broad based. So we'll introduce students uh, to the key approaches, theoretical frameworks, uh, conceptual frameworks focused on public policy as well as public administration. Uh, and like most of the PhD programs you hear about both in FASS um, as well as the business school, the first two years uh, is really, really focused on preparing students uh, to get this broad-based knowledge, preparing them for the QEs, which they will take uh, at the end of the second year. The, the, uh, there are eight core modules that students would have to take, and these are really focused on the key frameworks in public policy, public administration, uh, introducing students to the key frameworks uh, and theories with regards to economics, as well as political science. 
uh, the nature of public policy education is, uh, you know, by its very nature, inter interdisciplinary. Uh, the other key emphasis in the core modules, which essentially be methods and methods training. So they are in fact, um, four modules related to that. That's uh, training in quantitative methods, uh, qualitative methods, uh, also a graduate seminar focusing uh, really on research design uh, for the students. So these eight core modules are addressed uh, within the, those first two years uh, and students would sit for qualifying exams uh, based on these modules and clear that. Uh, beyond that, then uh, there are key specializations which students then explore as they prepare for the uh, oral defense and the writing stage, i.e. the dissertation, right? And the dissertation uh, research work. Um, the, these specializations are in many ways uh, tied to key areas uh, of core focus of the school. So uh, for the LKY school, we've got specializations, particularly in social policy, uh, public governance, uh, public administration. Uh, and that is including, for example, uh, performance management performance manage, management within uh, public agencies. Uh, we've also had uh, a focus more recently on things related to international affairs or international relations. Uh, but we are, uh, there are only quite a small handful of students that we've started to admit uh, in this particular um, uh, segment. And I'll talk a little bit about why that's the case in relation uh, to the research uh, centers. Um, as with the other PhD programs, the emphasis is really uh, on honing on research skills uh, and students focus on this quite extensively as they go through. On average, the students coming through the school take about four to five years to five years to complete the PhD program uh, um, and uh, would graduate uh, at the end of the fifth year. Uh, we take in uh, only about five to six PhD students per year. So as I mentioned, it's a very small program. Uh, we get about 65 to 100 applications uh, per year, and uh, hopefully that increase. All of the students admitted to the LKY School of Public Policy are usually uh, are funded uh, um, and uh, at the point of entry. Um, in terms of placement, as I mentioned, uh, our students are primarily, or our graduates are primarily placed in academic institutions. So we've got uh, our students uh, get, getting, you know, getting positions in uh, universities, particularly within the region that includes uh, ANU, um, um, universities in Hong Kong, City University, the Education uh, University in Hong Kong as well. We've got placement also as far as uh, Central Asia. So uh, we've got students uh, getting positions in Nazarbayev University, uh, for example. Um, I mentioned uh, also about the, I thought I would mention the research centers because the research centers uh, link up really with the kind of specializations we've focused on developing um, at the school, as far as the PhD program is concerned. There are four key research centers uh, at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, there's an Asia Competitiveness Institute, the Institute of Water Policy, the Center of Asia and Globalization, and the fourth one is the Institute of Policy Studies, uh, or IPS. Uh, and uh, the students that we admit into the research programs generally are focused uh, in specializations with regards to uh, social and environmental policy, particularly working uh, very, very closely with the Institute of Water Policy uh, at the research, uh, which is our key research center. Uh, we've also got um, those working on uh, economic uh, policies with regards to inequality. And many of them uh, work very closely with researchers in the Asia Competitiveness Institute, as well as in IPS. The focus of the Institute of Policy Studies in Singapore is actually on key social policy issues within Singapore. The Center of Asia Globalization uh, is, uh, is where we are looking at questions re related to trade, financial globalization, um, as well as international relations with a particular focus on Asia and on Southeast Asia. So we are quite keen uh, to get applications uh, for those interested uh, in regional developments uh, within uh, the broader Asia region. And that's again tied to the kind of uh, 
research uh, agenda that we are developing within uh, CAG. Okay, let me move very quickly and then, uh, you know, later on I can maybe answer any questions uh, during the Q&A session. Let me move very quickly to the coursework by research. We offer four uh, master's programs um, uh, ranging between two, um, maximum of two years or one year. Uh, we have uh, among the four, three programs which are in the English language and one program that is in Mandarin. Um, our two uh, core two-year programs is the Masters in Public Policy and the Masters in International Affairs. Uh, the Masters in Public Policy requires uh, around a one to two-year working experience. We have a one-year Masters in Public Administration, uh, which requires five to eight years of working experience. Uh, and the Masters in Public Administration and Management, which is the Mandarin Language progr Program that also has applicants primarily uh, coming in with eight to 10 years of working experience. Uh, the masters by coursework programs are essentially applied professional degrees. Uh, and the focus is really on certain skill sets uh, required for uh, the for placement in uh, public sector, NGOs with a small slither that goes into the uh, private sector. Uh, let me just uh, end off here and uh, you know, we can come back to any questions that you may have. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Susanna. Um, so that brings us to the uh, Q&A segment of, uh, of today's discussion forum. So for those of you who have just joined us, um, uh, basically at this point, um, uh, it's going to be pretty informal. It's a really good opportunity for you to pose any questions that you might have to uh, to, to the various vice deans and heads of departments who are here representing the various faculties and schools. Um, there are already a couple of questions in the Q and A tab, so I think well, we, you should be able to see that at in at the low uh, in the lower portion of the of the Zoom um, of of the Zoom frame. Um, and there, you, you're welcome to type your questions. But really, because uh, the group is not particularly large, if you have a, a question, feel free to raise your hand, and uh, on my end, I, I will unmute you, and you can also ask your questions live. Um, for, for now, I think we can turn to the three questions that have already been posed in the Q and A section. I think two of them are for for, for Bruce, yes. and one is for uh, for Damien. So, um, uh, Bruce, would you like to uh, to take those questions live? Uh, Jessica, can our can our friends uh, overseas see the questions, or do I need to read them? I think they can see the questions, but it might be useful to just okay. quickly summarize. I'll start um, with the, the second one, which is uh, more straightforward. Uh, Katarina is asking whether the PhD program in Chinese studies is research or coursework. Sorry, I should have clarified the se that second slide I showed means that all of our uh, PhD programs are research, including coursework. When we use the term research in the NUS context, a degree by research, it means you have a thesis and you have a coursework. When we use the term coursework, like master's by coursework, it means only coursework and no thesis. So whether we're talking about master's by research, PhD by research, they will all have research and coursework involved. Okay, now Yifan is asking about the programs for in communications, new media, and cultural studies in Asia. Um, <clears throat> so the yes, admissions, admissions, for, uh, he also asking about admissions. Admissions in every department is handled by a committee. Generally, you will have uh, three, uh, three or four uh, colleagues, depending on the size of the department, usually representing several different aspects. Uh, so for example, in my own department, which is history, you'll have someone perhaps that does East Asian history, someone that does Southeast Asian history, so that they will be looking, will uh, have a variety of expertise. And so essentially, the, the way that the application process works is that your uh, your application admissions decisions are initially made at the departmental level, and then they are sent up to me, to my level, to be uh, confirmed, especially in terms of scholarship. 95% of the time, we're not going to second guess a department. Thus, basically, we are in most cases rubber stamping the department's request. But particularly for the allocation of scholarships, that has to be concerned, uh, confirmed by us. Once in a while, as a student, a department may put up a student for a scholarship. We think it's, uh, that candidate is a bit weak. We'll go back to the department, and in many cases, they can make a stronger case, and then we will give it. Requirements in terms of previous degrees 
both communications and cultural studies because they are really kind of multi multidisciplinary. Uh, they would have a, they would probably allow a wider variety of, of backgrounds. Uh, it also, what you can get in with in terms of background may also depend on uh, what kind, what particular aspect you want to study. For example, in communications and new media, they do a lot with now with, uh, there are several colleagues that work specifically on uh, aspects of health communications. So if you had an undergraduate degree in, let's say, health studies or background in health studies, you could possibly get accepted into that, that PhD program to work on that topic. So in both, uh, in, in both the um, co comparative Asian studies, comparative Asian studies, we are usually going to want you to have probably one of the regular uh, disciplines in the faculty. So if you came in with, let's say you had an engineering degree as an undergraduate or, or a um, biology or chemistry, that would probably be a fairly hard sell unless you had a certain amount of humanities and social science undergraduates. For communications, because they cover a wider variety, they are usually a bit more flexible in terms of the undergraduate studies. Uh, and I should add also that most of our candidates will come in with a master's degree. Uh, I did not emphasize this earlier. We are, NUS is in many ways a kind of hybrid between the British and American system. Most of our programs, uh, economics being one exception, and psychology, psychology and economics are often happy to take a student with a good undergraduate degree straight into PhD. Uh, most of our other programs would want you to have a master's first. And so if you had an undergraduate degree, which was fairly far removed, but you had a master's degree closer to the field, that would be uh, very useful. Uh, okay, yes. And then can I answer this last one? Uh, be, I have a third one up here, Jessica. So before I turn it over to Damien. Um, actually, why don't we let Damien answer it okay. and then um, I'll, okay. I'll repose Ivan's question because I think it's good uh, for everyone to answer that okay. Um, okay. Uh, because yeah. it's, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, All Bruce. Right. right, so briefly in relation to Malisha's question, uh, the, law, the law faculty's LLM program, its master's program, it has one general master's program. We, we have about 150 students and seven specialized pro, uh, programs from maritime law, intellectual property, international comparative law, Asian legal studies, corporate law, international business law, amongst them. Um, now, you've, you've asked also about uh, the restrictions on getting in uh, in relation to the current pandemic. And I, I think what I'm going to say isn't specific to law, but to, to all faculties. But crudely, it's, it's the government that decides, not the university. If there are no, no government restrictions on students coming in other than quarantine, then we're delighted to have people here on site uh, here in Singapore. So, for example, at the moment, we have lots of first students on site here in Singapore from China. Unfortunately, that's not been possible for students from India, who uh, there's still government restrictions, unfortunately, they're coming in. And so we're obviously offering teaching there by, by Zoom. Yeah, thanks very much, John, for the answer. And, and I think that's uh, exactly right. I think with regard to COVID restrictions, if you have any further queries on that, um, you know, I, I, I would uh, encourage you very much to connect directly with the department of faculty that you are uh, interested in, 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 uh, in, in exploring further. There, there is also uh, a, um, a, an ongoing um, discussion um, um, with, with some of the administrators where you can clarify a lot more of these um, uh, sort of uh, re requirement, administrative requirements as well as uh, potential concerns that you might have about uh, COVID restrictions. So Jessica, I would suggest for those issues contacting, going straight to the faculty. Most departments are probably not going to have uh, the latest information and departments will refer back. To, to the faculty. Them. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, so exactly. Um, I think it, as part of this process, certainly connect with the faculties and uh, they'll, they'll provide you with the most up-to-date information uh, regarding this. Maybe we um, could just, sorry, just clarify also that uh, to add on to uh, Prof. Damien's comment, what's happening now with the countries that are allowed in 
is that a certain number of international students have been allowed in each week. So essentially you sort of, there's kind of an informal lottery that you have had to, you would keep trying to book a slot when you would be able to come into the country. And as he said, it, this has worked for most of the uh, countries now with the uh, exception of, uh, of India. Yeah, no, it's it's very much a constantly evolving situation. And unfortunately, the decisions are all kind of not made at the university level. And so the university pretty much has to follow government restrictions. But I think by and large, you know, we, we do our best in accommodating various situations. So certainly, if you've been admitted, and you need to do your first year coursework, and you are unable to enter the country, uh, there will be, you know, uh, uh, there'll be provisions made for online teaching. Um, and I think if, you know, uh, for, for, for whatever reasons you might wish to delay your start date, uh, I think that can also be worked out with the faculty on a case by case basis. So um, we're fully aware of, of the pandemic situation and we, we very much want to make sure that it doesn't um, interfere with, with your PhD studies. Um, okay, um, turning next to, uh, to the question uh, from Ivan, uh, the reason I kind of wanted to pause on that was because I thought I would open this question up to actually everyone uh, on the panel. Um, it's, it's a very uh, interesting question about uh, thinking about whether or not NUS is open or you know, your specific programs are open in terms of interdisciplinary study and what are sort of the various kinds of uh, uh, um, uh, ways in which students might be able to take subjects or courses beyond the department or how is sort of interdisciplinary kind of study encouraged within the programs, uh, if at all. So uh, maybe we can start with Bruce and then, you know, whoever else um, would like to chime in, um, are more than welcome to do so. Yes, in, in FAST, it is certainly strongly encouraged. I mean, it would be fairly rare, actually, uh, in, in a certain number of disciplines that you would do all of your coursework within your department. So this is particularly true because we have all the Asian studies departments. And so, for example, Chinese studies, uh, South Asian studies, my, and again, in my field of history, there are historians in all of the other departments. So typically, our students will move back and forth be among the different departments. Uh, we have a sort of rule of thumb that normally you can take up to one quarter of your specific modules uh, outside your department uh, within uh, the faculty, but that is flexible. Not many of our students would uh, go across faculty lines, but we would allow it. So for example, if you had a, a student who was working on um, something historical on let's say Southeast Asian architecture, and there was something in the uh, School of Design and Environment that was relevant for them, they would certainly be allowed to do it. So yes, we, we encourage this very much and uh, it is usually quite, uh, quite easy to arrange. Obviously the things that you're going to take need to, uh, need to broadly fit into your program, but within those constraints, yes, quite a bit. Um, are there any other panelists who might want to, you know, sort of further elaborate on interdisciplinary studies uh, within their within their uh, various programs? So I can say a few words on that. For the business school, it would be unusual for somebody to have only studies in their area. I think it'd be hard to fashion a program that way. So our typical students will, by design, take a large chunk of courses in either economics or in psychology. Um, depending on what areas they're in, but they may also be going over to applied math or going over to the School of Computing. So I would say roughly half the coursework in a PhD program in the business school, depending on the department, is actually outside the business school even. It's, and, and so you usually end up crossing multiple um, schools to end up getting a PhD in the business school because of the nature of the program. Yeah, I thought I would jump in. I mean, by as I mentioned earlier, for public policy, it's by nature interdisciplinary. So the initial focus in the core modules is, is really the broad overview. Uh, and then subsequently, I think, uh, depending on the focus of the student on the specialization, then we would expect uh, you know, the student to be communicating, taking courses in um, other faculties, right? So for example, we've had uh, students that have worked very closely, uh, well, whose focus uh, her focus was really on public health, and, uh, and she went on uh, then to work uh, directly with uh, Sosri Hawk, um, you know, as she prepared for her dissertation. So it's sort of very, very natural within, uh, within the public policy school for it to be inherently interdisciplinary. 
So uh, um, just I wanted to quickly jump in here. I think just to reinforce what you know Bruce Azina and uh, David all said. I think very much uh, with our PhD program, part of the reason for setting up the NUS Graduate School uh, was really to kind of allow PhD students to also make it even easier for them to collaborate across schools. Uh, and faculty. So I think in general, um, we always sort of work with the uh, idea that one should always craft a PhD journey that works best for them and the supervisors in the schools are really there to support your journey. So uh, along the way, if you, you know, feel that you need to pick up extra courses or maybe even a supervisor from a different faculty or school, generally speaking, I think, you know, we highly encourage that. Uh, of course, in consultation with your supervisor as well as your, 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 your program. The other thing I should add is that, you know, sort of to, to, to reinforce that and maybe to even for students who um, might not, you know, who, who might think think of the PhD journey as being very disciplinary specific, we um, um, uh, we are actually in the midst of um, uh, putting in place certain requirements uh, where we, uh, we we sort of you know require students from the upcoming cohort to actually take two modules outside of their specific departments. Uh, with the specific idea of really trying to expose you to things that are going that are going on outside of your department or outside of your faculty, and so we're actually going to be putting that in uh, as specific requirements uh, moving forward. So, but these would be you know just a couple of modules again with the idea of exposing students to things that are beyond their sort of disciplinary boundaries. Um, Bruce, you have raised your yeah. hand. So I thought, yeah, I thought I would just maybe mention if if some of our friends are not fully. Uh, fully familiar with the differences between the American and Canadian systems on the one hand and the British system on the other. Because in, in the British system, you are largely going to be concentrating on your thesis itself and not doing much coursework. And you'll tend to probably have a bit narrower focus. But because our approach of combining research with a certain number of a certain amount of coursework reflects the American system, it therefore also reflects the, uh, even if it's not as structured as an American system where you might have a major field and two minor fields in your PhD, there is a very, very strong emphasis on uh, moving outside your field and getting broader training, both within the scope of your thesis, but also potentially training you as uh, teachers over the long run. Uh, if some some students may feel that the one attraction of the of the British system is that you get through it quicker, which is true, but it's also important to realize the extra time that you spend doing coursework along with your research that's going to be invaluable when you go out and begin to teach because it's very rare, at least in our fields uh, in my faculty that you're going to get a position a long term academic position where you don't teach. So the training that you've had in different fields will make you a much stronger a teacher in the classroom along with the research. Great, thank you. Um, so um, there is actually a raised hand in the audience. Um, maybe I can invite Alexa to, um, to, to, to post the question in person. Uh, Alexa, please go ahead. Oh, hey, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, and this question is also for Professor Lockhart. Um, you know, just going off of uh, you mentioning the, uh, you know, in the US PhD programs, uh, kind of combining the characteristics of both the British and US um, systems, I think I am interested in um, pursuing like postdoc um, or teaching, you know, uh, jobs in the US or North America in yes. general. And I was wondering, um, you know, I was reading certain comments from like academics in the US saying, um, you know, the, the difference in the UK and US systems can sometimes make students coming from like a UK uh, education or UK related uh, kind of uh, region um, a little bit harder to be uh, accepted into like U.S. postdoc programs um, because of like, uh, you know, U.S. perception or understanding conception of what a PhD education should look like, you know, the the shorter or, you know, uh, fewer teaching experiences, etc. I understand that um, in U.S. does have the teaching component and the coursework training component, but still um, is much you know, shorter and uh, like you said, less structured. So I was just wondering, you know, in general, how competitive um, and, you know, I'm interested in the new uh, new media communications program and the cultural studies program, um, you know, how, how competitive would any US students um, graduates be in the US or North America job market? And are there things we can do um, in, at in US that could, you know, increase our chances yes. there? That's an excellent question, Alexa. I would say 
Certainly for postdocs, I think that an NUS PhD um, is reasonably competitive. I would have to be honest that in most of our fields, the North American job market is already so overcrowded with graduates from uh, American universities, that would be tough. Uh, mm. However, if you got into a postdoc uh, in the States, that would of course put you uh, more into that, into that system. Mm. And you are certainly absolutely right that especially if an American, uh, if an American postdoc is expecting you to do some teaching, uh, then having some experience will be better. Now, we do not, in our faculty, we are fairly conservative about having PhD students uh, do lecture modules, but conversely, virtually every PhD student will have several semesters as a tutor or teaching assistant, so that you, do, you would get a certain amount of classroom experience, which I think would also strengthen your case in applying for PhD in the States. Understood. And then just a quick follow up. Um, so for the communications and new media uh, and cultural studies uh, PhD programs, you were talking about them, uh, but just wanted to make sure uh, it sounds like a master's degree is not required, right? You can apply with a bachelor's. Well, no, I mean, I, what I, I may not have expressed myself very clearly. Most of our programs actually do want you to have a master's. The exceptions would be something like psychology and economics, the very heavily quantitative ones, where if you have an undergraduate degree, then mm -hmm. uh, they will uh, often take you directly into PhD. My point was more that for uh, programs like CNM and cultural studies in Asia, because they cover a wide range of, of disciplines, that mm -hmm. you could have a master's that was uh, from a wider variety of topics. But in, you would, I think, in applying for PhD, if you in those programs, if you did not have any master's at all, I think unless you had a very strong, very well uh, suited uh, undergraduate degree, you would be less competitive. Understood. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Um, so I think there are several more questions in the Q and A box. So uh, I think the next question is for David, um, and it, it's all related to actually um, you know requirements coming into applying for a PhD program. So for the business school, I would this question refers to: Do you need a bachelor's degree related to business to apply to the MSc in management? I would say about half the students in the MSc programs have business degrees, and about half don't. And back when I got my own MSc degree. I was a prime example of that. My bachelor's degree is actually in history and political science. And then I went and got a master's degree in finance and then went to get the PhD. The MSc program and actually the PhD program as well is less focused on whether you have a bachelor's degree in business. They're more focused on um, what did you actually study and are you truly interested in this material? Um, and do you, do you show promise in the area? Great, thank you. Um, there is a question I think for, um, so there's a, a more general question by, by Kaho. Um, so I think this is a question probably, Bruce, uh, would you be comfortable okay. taking it? Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, she is asking, uh, she wants to transition you. back into education with, with a master's program in Singapore. And she's asking about clinical psych. Now, uh, clinical psych, our clinical psych program is very much focused on professionals. So to my knowledge, basically to get into the clinical psych program, you would have to already be a professional in that field. Uh, so it is, it, it is essentially both the, the, PH, the master's program and eventually we hope to have a PhD, those are very much focused on uh, specifically training, uh, further training of people already in the field. If your undergraduate degree was in psychology, uh, then uh, it would be possible to apply for the master's. Now, you mentioned combining, it, a, a, combining an interest in psychology and computer science. Uh, it I think it would really depend. You would certainly have to have a home in one department and one faculty or the other. Uh, if you were doing a specific research topic that included both, you could do, you could almost certainly do modules from both of them. But I would, that one, I would recommend Koho, that you, you uh, contact 
both departments in advance before applying tell them your specific interests and get advice from them because that that's something that's fairly specific that would have to be decided by the department in principle we can work things out with uh even with departments and other faculties but it would have to be something that would uh that would make sense to us and would seem to fit yeah i think that makes sense i think from my understanding with both programs is also that certainly at the phd level there's quite a lot of uh, collaboration between computer science and psychology at the moment yes. uh, for the for the specific masters in clinical psychology i think that one is a bit trickier because i think that's a lot more by coursework and preparing uh, people for 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 a uh, sort of professional qualification yes as and as i said just it is in fact it's not even really preparing them. Normally, you have to, as my understanding, you have to already be in that field. Right. So clinical psych program. is like our social work programs that, generally speaking, it is value added for people already in the field. So it would, I don't think you would go there to be trained from scratch as a clinical psychologist. Right. Great. Thank you. Um, I think the, the, the other question is for, uh, for Damien. Well, so, so this is a very uh, specialized question. I think it's about the masters on maritime law. Um, so very briefly, the graduate diploma is for people who don't have a law degree uh, and the LLM is for people who have a law degree in mar mar maritime law. So depending on your circumstance, if you've got a law degree, please do the LLM. Uh, if you don't, then uh, you, please take the diploma. Great. Uh, Annette, you have a question for uh, uh, Professor Rudy. Uh, would you like to un ask this question live? I can unmute you. Um, maybe I'll, yeah. Hello. Hi. Hello, am I audible? Yes, you are. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, Professor Rudy. Good morning. Uh, sir, actually, I would just, I was interested in the PhD program in architecture, mm -hmm. uh, specifically in the design education. I would like to know if uh, uh, the GRE scores are mandatory for application at the moment, owing to the current COVID scenario. Oh, sorry, what is mandatory? Uh, the GRE, GRE scores, it was written in the website. Is it mandatory? Okay, in, in the Department of Architecture, we um, do not make the GRE mandatory. Um, I mean, we encourage uh, students to submit uh, GRE scores, but in the absence of GRE, we will put more emphasis on um, their uh, grades in the um, master's program um, or bachelor program that they have uh, done in the past. Um, so it is, not, it is not a requirement. Okay, and uh, for international students, how, how good are the scholarships? Are there a couple of scholarships for international students? We have very few scholarships. Um, so it is very hard to um, come by. It's very competitive. Um, there's usually only um, one or two um, available each year. And um, there's, a, yeah, there's a large um, number of applicants all vying for a um, scholarship. So you really have to stand out um, and you know be outstanding in order to be able to get a scholarship. Okay, and one more question, sir. Uh, is, it, uh, is it mandatory to uh, contact the supervisors first and discuss the proposal with them or? Uh... It, it's not mandatory, but it's definitely strongly advised. Um, from the past, I'm, I know that uh, chances of getting accepted to the PhD program are um, improved if you have uh, spoken to, if you select a potential supervisor, and ideally if you also, also have contacted him. In, in your case, I see that you are um, interested in design education research. That um, research area is actually, um, fairly uh, new. I mean, not that we don't, haven't done such research in the past, but um, establishing it as a research cluster is a fairly recent. So I would strongly advise you actually to um, talk to one of the um, uh, potential supervisors in, in the area um, and talk about your, your interests and how they this would fit into the um, research being done within the department. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. You're welcome.
Great, um, thank you. Um, so the, the next question is actually uh, by Alexin, and it's quite a general question about NUS scholarships. So I thought I would take it uh, on behalf of the panel. Um, so the question is um, that um, that on the uh, NUS scholarship website, uh, the NUS research scholarship is sometimes awarded to master's students. Is that correct? So um, that is generally correct, but I would say that it varies quite a lot across faculties. Uh, in particular, I would say that by and large, um, most faculties do not offer uh, research scholarships to master's uh, students, with the exception actually of FASS, where we do have a very small number of research scholarships that we can um, uh, award to master's students. So generally speaking, I would say that um, most of the research scholarships are reserved for PhD students, uh, with a very small number of exceptions for you know, really exceptional students um, uh, that, that can be granted uh, research scholarships. Uh, and, and in particular, I think if you're an international student, I would say that there are actually very few research scholarships uh, for master students. Um, so so that's the sort of, uh, and again, I think if that's something you're interested in, I would, I would encourage you to check with the faculty whether that is an option um, 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 for you. Uh, with regards to the President's Graduate Fellowships, that's actually open to um, PhD students and um, uh, across all faculties. We, uh, there, there isn't a fixed number of um, slots that are granted to each faculty, and in particular, um, actually, the way it works is that, generally speaking, you will indicate your interest for the PGF, but um, the President's Graduate Fellowship is really um, for uh, exceptional PhD students that NUS is trying to uh, attract. Um, how it usually works is that the faculties and schools will nominate students from their existing uh, pool of applicants for consideration for the PGF. So uh, for the President's Graduate Fellowship, apart from the fact that it's uh, um, sort of a highly regarded scholarship, uh, there are so somewhat better terms for the stipends. Um, all of these candidates are then sort of uh, put side by side and the uh, NUS Graduate School um, has a committee that actually um, with representatives from the various faculties that will actually evaluate these candidates. And then on the basis of merit, we would then um, award these, um, these scholarships. So there isn't a set number, meaning that if in a particular year, there is a particularly good crop of uh, candidates, say from business, for example, uh, you know, we could award uh, a lot more PGFs to business than we would in previous years, uh, again, depending on the caliber of students. So it's uh, very much for the uh, faculties to make a case as to why a student is deserving of the PGF. So, um, I, um, and, and so to answer the last part of that question, if a, a student is not given a PGF, most likely they will be given a research scholarship because um, a faculty will only kind of nominate someone for the PGF if they think that the student should be getting a research scholarship. So I would say most students who are, almost all students who are nominated for a PGF by their faculties would already be kind of assured um, a scholarship um, because they would have to be good enough in order to be nominated for a PGF. Okay, yeah. Um, if, 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 yeah. So I think the next question is for um, uh, Bruce and Susanna. Uh, Bruce, would you like to take the question from Mac? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mac is asking. He says uh, they have a bachelor's degree in economics and master's degree in rural development, but have been doing social work for about ten years. Can I pursue a PhD or with uh, take? A, do I need a master's first? Uh, for that that kind of situation, you should check directly with the department because it is really uh, a situation like that. Ultimately. We do at the faculty level, we do not have a clear policy that you have to have a master's or you don't have to have a master's. It is a depart department by department, and they would basically look at your individual situation and help you to decide. There are not that many people doing PhDs in social work, and those that come tend to be a local. So uh, they would certainly take a very serious look at you and tell you whether or not uh, you would need the master's. So go ahead and contact the social work department directly for that. Thank you. Uh, next question from Ting Ling um, is uh, for uh, Susanna. Okay, uh, this is actually very specific uh, uh, to me. Uh, and uh, I think Bruce can come in to talk about uh, looking com uh, studying comparative politics uh, locally. Uh, so since we've moved, uh, I think, to a much more uh, US system, right? I think there is actually quite a bit of similarity now between uh, a PhD program uh, locally done versus in the US. I think in the past, when we were following a much more uh, sort of uh, British, um, uh, British framework where the focus was really on the dissertation, uh, there was a bit more of a, uh, a differential. So 
when you're doing the a PhD in the US as, as, uh, as, as I was in comparative politics, again, the first two years, similar to what you encounter here, the first two years is just giving you that broad based general um, interdisciplinary work, uh, in this case within political science, uh, before you moved on uh, into the specialization uh, and that could be a specialization in area studies. So, so what you do in the case of the US is uh, in your three, you know, um, year three and year four, you go into focusing on Southeast Asia uh, and you work within the area studies of Southeast Asia. So that was my experience uh, in, in Wisconsin. Uh, now, the, we've, you know, since we've moved into a US type system, the system it's, it's fairly similar to how you would do it, uh, I think, within the US now, right? Uh, where it follows that same uh, structure. I think the one advantage, obviously, if you're interested in Southeast Asia, is the one advantage, obviously, of being in Singapore and doing it uh, locally is actually ultimately, um, even though I was doing it in the US in my year three and four, I still had to come back being based within the region, right? Uh, there were certain things that I would have to do, the field work and all that required me to be back in the region. And so if you're within the region, in this case, uh, within Singapore, that puts you at a, at, at a great advantage uh, in terms of uh, proceeding on with your year three and four subsequently, because ultimately that had to, we had to revert back to being in the region. And in fact, I did come back uh, when I was preparing for my field work to be based in Singapore uh, before I went on to proceed to doing field work in Indonesia. So I don't know, Bruce, like, actually it's a, it's, it's, it's a comparison, uh, but it's related to actually doing comparative politics yes. in Southeast Asian studies uh, at NUS versus, yes. versus yes. being in the US. Yes, and uh, like like Prof. Susaina, I am also the product of a, of a top Southeast Asian Studies program. I'm I'm Cornell trained, and she was Wisconsin trained. Uh, my general advice to students tingling for something like this is that it would be good to do the masters here first, uh, because both because as a if you are a strong if you get a first uh, in at, in FAS, if you get a first class honors, you have a very strong chance of getting some kind of financial support if you stay on for a master's. Whereas if you go to do a master's in the States, you're almost certainly going to be paying for yourself. Second, uh, the if you have a master's from NUS, that makes you much more competitive in applying to PhD programs in the States. Uh, in my, I've been, this is my 24th year at NUS, we have sent uh, my department history, we've sent probably 12 to 15 students overseas for PhDs. Almost every single one of them had a master's first, and they were all able to get places. Only the two or three very brightest people were able to go to the States directly into a PhD. So I think that the uh, master's program is doing a master's first and then taking it from there is a very good way to approach it. Great, thanks. It sounds like really useful advice. Um, there's a raised hand um, from B Bilal. Um, Bilal, um, can I invite you to, um, to 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 ask your question and also to switch on your video so that you know we, we can sort of put a face to our to a voice. Um, hi there. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Um, so I'm currently I'm going into my third year of undergrad studies and I'm looking to do a master's at NUS uh, in economics because I'm studying economics. I just wanted to know, like, because uh, you mentioned it's really highly competitive. So what else could I do to make my application stand out? Okay, uh, Prof Pan is from the economics department. So I think I will ask her to field out. You want to do, Bilal, you want to do the economics by master's by research or the master's by coursework? Um, I haven't actually made up um, uh, my mind, but I was thinking okay. leaning more towards coursework. Okay, yeah. Um, right. That one, yeah. Sure, no problem. So, um, yeah, so I think for the uh, for the master's program, I think we have a very competitive master's program. Um, it, it, it's a program that's actually much bigger than the uh, than the PhD program. So I think naturally, if you, if the intention of pursuing the master's program is sort of, you know, you're trying to decide if you want to do a PhD or maybe to use it to go into industry. I think, you know, uh, in terms of preparation for both, um, I, I think our program does 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 a does, does a good job. Um, I think, again, I think, you know, we'll be looking basically at undergraduate coursework, the uh, undergraduate coursework, 
uh, need, need not necessarily be in economics. I think we're one of those programs where we actually take in students from a variety of different fields. So especially if you have good quantitative training in your undergraduate program, or if you're in a undergraduate program that is not particularly quantitative, but you've, you know, sort of uh, taken on an interest in quantitative uh, courses within your, your field of study, that would be something that we would look out for in your application. So um, I think in terms of how to make yourself more co competitive, you know, we, we will be looking at things like GRE scores, uh, undergraduate uh, performance in these modules. I think you might be aware that uh, economics training at the master's and PhD level uh, in um, all, all major universities, including NUS, is very quantitative. So we will be looking for some indication that, you know, you're not afraid of math. Uh, and in fact, if you, uh, I, I always advise my own students that if they are afraid of math, then perhaps a, P, uh, a master's or PhD in economics may not be something I would uh, re recommend. Um, so I think that would sort of be sort of the main pieces I would think about in terms of making your uh, application more competitive. Maybe okay. just to, to add also on that, Bilal, there, I think because the economics department has a very large master's by coursework, but also a very a strong master's by research, it, there, there, it really does depend what you are interested in and what your career trajectory is. The, uh, the coursework program is growing by leaps and bounds. And generally speaking, if you have a strong undergraduate degree and are willing to pay the fees, you, you can probably come. For the master's by research, where they are going, the department's going to be assessing you in some different some. Uh, different ways because they're going to be looking to, they're going to be assessing you as someone who's going to come in and write a fairly extensive thesis, as opposed to someone who's simply going to come in and be taking modules. So, uh, and the, so there's, I, I think Prof. Jessica would agree, there's somewhat slightly different lenses or, or, or bars that you would use to measure coursework and research students. Right. Yeah. And to just add on that, I think uh, for coursework, uh, again, by and large, is in US policy. We don't offer scholarships for that. Uh, however, if you are interested in a scholarship, um, there is the Masters by Research program, and we do have a very limited number of uh, research scholarships that we can um, offer to um, Masters by Research students. But again, very competitive because Typically, our scholarships are reserved for PhD students. Uh, that being said, I think if you know if 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 you you are interested in a PhD moving forward, um, uh, we, we do encourage students to uh, come into the masters by research program and then subsequently decide if they want to switch to the PhD program. And that's something that uh, you know uh, we we do sort of um, we we do sort of allow. So um, I think a lot of it again depends on your sort of um, you know career trajectory and what 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 you're interested in pursuing. Okay. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that does. Uh, just, just a quick one um, as well. Um, in terms of uh, quantitative skills, so I'm doing economics and accounting. So it's like a joint degree at University of Bristol. Um, but I, I am comfortable with maths. So like to get into the course, I needed a minimum of an A uh, in maths and I managed to achieve an A star to get into the undergrad course. But I thought the course would be more quantitative than it is. Um, um, but is that really going to pose an issue? I'm quite comfortable with doing maths, though. Yeah. So yeah. I, again, I think I think um, you know it's it's uh, generally speaking, I would say if if you're pretty comfortable, at, you know, in math and the economics training at, at University of Bristol, which I, I assume it, it should be, is fairly quantitative in nature at the undergraduate level. I think that shouldn't be a big issue. Like what Bruce mentioned, we do have um, a, a pretty large masters by coursework program, um, and so students come in from pretty you know, sort of varied backgrounds. Um, I would say in general, you know, if you have a, a, a very decent GRE score for, 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 the, for the quantitative component, um, I think you should be fine. I mean, we, we, it's, it's not, I think it's uh, our sort of master's by coursework and PhD program uh, in uh, economics, it, it, it's sort of fairly standard in terms of its quantitative treatment. So if you do open a graduate textbook in, um, you know, intermediate microeconomics and, you know, um, the, the thing you know that the sort of level of math there is something that you're you know fairly comfortable with i would say you should, really shouldn't have a, a huge problem so things like calculus um at, at a slightly higher level if that's something you're comfortable with then you know it, then then that that should be sort of uh, the basic requirement for for the masters by coursework program i would say okay perfect yeah that sounds good thank you very much great thank you um, so I think turning back to the questions in the Q&A forum, I think there are two questions actually for Rudy um, that seem somewhat interrelated. So thanks, Bilal. Yeah, thank you. Um, the first question is from Sean and is uh, interested in uh, studying Master of Architecture through coursework. And he's asking about um, possible uh, financial aid 
It's, it's true there are no um, scholarships available for a Master of Architecture program. In, um, there may be some financial aid, um, but I'm really not that familiar with it. I would really suggest you to um, contact uh, Ms. Wendy Tan. Um, her uh, email address is on the um, website of the Master of Architecture program to ask that uh, particular question to have that answered. The other um, question is by um, Ivy Yun, um, and he's interest, or interested in the Masters in Urban Planning um, program. Um, for the Masters in Urban Planning program, you definitely do not need a design background. It's actually open to um, people with the, from a variety of disciplines, including um, architecture related, as well as um, civil engineering, geography, um, real estate, et cetera. Um, what we do ask is that you um, have some engagement with urban issues in the past. I would assume that working at a real estate developer that may have um, give you so, some of that um, background. Um, but for further, yeah, for, for more fine answer, um, I think it would be important to um, contact a person um, directly related to the Master of Urban Planning. But I think it would be um, worthwhile to um, submit um, an application if interested. Thank you. Great, thanks, Rudy. Um, I think, yeah, so the next question by Archana and yeah, it's, it's, um, I, I think Bruce, you can, okay, would be directed at Bruce, yeah. Okay, so, uh, probably okay. the next question too, so the one on Southeast, uh, South Asian studies. Yeah. Okay, so Archana is asking about the uh, scholar, PhD scholarships. Uh, <clears throat> we, each department offers a few uh, PhD scholarships in each incoming cohort. And so it, it would cover uh, it would cover tuition and a monthly stipend, but it does not cover accommodation. And you would want to, at the time that you apply to the program, you would want to indicate that you want to be considered for that because the decisions on scholarship support are made uh, right at the time of admissions. It's basically all a single package for applicants. Uh, okay, uh, Raymond is asking uh, an excellent question about the Masters in Southeast Asian Studies. Uh, okay, two questions. The Masters in, Masters in Southeast Asian Studies right now, Raymond, is it is basically being it is closed down for revamping. Uh, it is going to uh, it is going to be a reborn uh, essentially as a self funded program, meaning a lot more expensive, but uh, probably even better quality. And it sh I believe it will be coming online uh, for next academic year. It is it is being worked on right now, and it will depend how quickly we can get everything together and get it up and running. So it would be either August, uh, ideally August 2022, or worst case scenario, uh, 2023. And uh, yes, being a, I mean being a, a SUS graduate, if you have a uh, if you have a strong record uh, in uh, if you have a strong record as an undergraduate, we would certainly uh, look at you on the same basis as NTU and SNU. Now the masters in the Masters in Southeast Asian Studies by research, yes, that is still going because Masters by research and Masters by coursework are two completely separate programs. Uh, you would really want to, you would really want to think about which one of those is the best option for you. Uh, probably unless you're unless you're really going to go on and do uh, academics then an academic career, probably the master's in coursework would be the better option. So uh, you, you may want to wait a year. Uh, you can contact the Southeast Asian Studies program, uh, sorry, department directly to ask them uh, when, uh, ask them more about the program. But we are working on it right now, as I said, and I believe we hope to have it up and running next year. Great, thanks, Bruce. Um, so I think there are quite a few questions that are coming in fast and furious, so uh, that's great. I think the next question is actually another quick question about masters in um, um, in, in in the School of uh, Design and Environment for 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 uh, Rudy. Yes, there's a 
question from um, Wang. Right. Yeah. Um, trying to decide between the Master of Science Integrated Sustainable Design and the Master of Urban Planning. Um, they are quite two quite different programs in the sense that the Master of Urban Planning is a two-year um, program, whereas the uh, MSc in Integrated Sustainable Design is a one-year program. Also, the latter has uh, two intakes, so it's starting both in August and in January, whereas the Master of Urban Planning only has one intake. However, in, in terms of your background in um, environmental science and engineering, um, both programs actually target an interdisciplinary mix of um, students um, from different um, backgrounds. So I think it's really up to you um, in terms of you know, where your um, real interest lies to identify with and, and maybe your uh, means in, to identify which of the two programs would be better suited for you. Thank you. Thanks, Rudy. Um, so there's a question by Ivan about the uh, JPADB scholarship, um, uh, specifically applied to the Department of Economics. So I think the JPADB scholarship, that's, um, it's a very specific scholarship. And actually, I did a very quick Google search. Uh, and I think uh, NUS is part of, the, uh, of that scholarship, actually not just economics, but I think also the business school and the School of Public Policy. So my understanding with these scholarships, actually, Suzanne, feel free to jump in because I think you might uh, have encountered more of these applicants. But my understanding with this scholarship is that you apply directly to the ADB. And if you do get one of these scholarships, um, I think uh, basically the um, host institution, in this case, NUS, would, would, uh, would, 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 would be part of that arrangement. Is that correct, Susanna? Yeah, so um, uh, we, we essentially we forward the names uh, to ADB. Uh, they, they are, it is funding for the masters by coursework uh, and um, the students on our side who have received it are primarily in the MPP program, which is the two year program. Uh, and so we would, uh, you know, based on the criteria that ADB sets up, uh, we provide the nominations to them and it's direct with them. Yeah. Great. Yeah, thanks. That, that helps a lot because I haven't seen those applications come my way, but I yeah. think you apply directly to the departments, either business, econ, or right. public policy. And then if you're interested in a scholarship, I think we will liaise directly with the ADB um, and, and basically nominate students based on that criteria. And if I'm not mistaken, I think the ADB will, 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 will basically decide they want to award the scholarship. Uh, to right. to these students, That's so right. um, so it's done as part of the application process. And again, if this is something that you're interested in, feel free to contact directly, um, you know, people from the uh, from the faculty or department uh, mm -hmm. that, that it's part of the JP uh, ADB scholarship as well. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so there is a que uh, there is a raised hand by uh, Alexa. Alexa, would you like to uh, uh, post a question live? Um, I I think I've uh, yeah. Okay, sure. sure. Thank you so much. Um, Sorry for taking up so much space, but I wanted to ask these questions because someone brought up admissions and, um, you know, I thought it would be useful for everyone to hear. Like one thing I was wondering um, is about recommendation letters. I see a few other, um, you know, prospective students asking the Q&A section that, um, you know, they have stayed uh, out of academia, out of school and been working for a few years. I myself, I graduated in 2017 and uh, I've been working as a journalist for the past three years, uh, four years. So I I was wondering in terms of um, the recommendation letters, should I, um, I'm still in touch with my um, undergrad uh, professor, so uh, I can do that, or would it be useful or better um, to ask like a, you know, employer or supervisor at work? Um, and then um, I was wondering about like the research proposal is um, quite different from my understanding of like the statement purpose in the US situation. So I was just wondering um, there, I, I, I'm, I'm again, I'm interested in the, you know, communication new media department. So, um, I'm, I'm thinking, and th their gu departmental guideline is that it should be about a hundred, a thousand to two thousand words, um, and at least two pages. So it's quite a broad set of um, parameters. So I was wondering if um, people, uh, probably particularly Professor Lockhart, can provide more guidance um, in terms of what uh, you know admission officers and faculty members would be looking for um, when looking at these proposals what do you want to see in them and um, 
also uh, how personal do they need to be? Like I'm kind of uh, getting, I guess, conflicting messages about like, uh, you know, like how, if we should approach it as a, you know, straight up academic paper or more like an application essay that's like more personal or persuasive. Um, yeah, and uh, where should we po put the, the focus? Uh, should it be on like literature review or methodology? Um, you know, just general, some general guidelines. Um, and then uh, a final quick question about scholarships. Um, I know in the online application system, you sort of indicate your interest in one type of scholarships, but sometimes, you know, multiple kinds would apply. Just wondering how, you know, how, how we should approach that if we, uh, you know, select one in the application system, then would be, we just not be considered for the others? Um, or if we can indicate interest for other scholarships somewhere else? Yeah, thanks. Okay, sorry, I got a bit lost in your questions, Alexa. What was the first one? Oh, sorry. Yeah, first one about recommendation letters, second okay, one about yes, okay. uh, okay. these proposals. Yeah. Yeah. For, okay, you're, I assume if you're asking from FAST perspective, normally for uh, recommendation letters, for references for the uh, academic programs, the more academic referees you have, the better. Because we are, in, in most cases, we don't find... Uh, supervisors comments particularly helpful because mm. we're, we want to uh, evaluate you as a student right so um, possibly let's say if you're submitting three references and you want to have uh, one from an academic sorry from your work supervisor that's probably okay but you'd want to have the other two I think academic and if you're only submitting two references, then you would want to have at least one from an academic. Because again, the, in most cases, what, what the kind of feedback and input that your uh, work supervisor is going to give is not the best suited for assessing your, um, your performance, okay? Your intellectual. intellectual. Uh, okay, then the last one you asked, what, yeah, sorry, second, the, the uh, research proposal, that varies, that's something you would want to ask your uh, department, the specific department, in this case, CNM, that you're applying to Alexa. The reason is because, again, different departments have different standards on this. So in, I believe, in psychology, for example, they're much more interested in a broad statement of purpose. Generally speaking, though, a research proposal, it, it, it has to be enough to just give us an idea of, of um, how well you understand the topic that you want to work on and to show and, and at least a brief lit review. If a, it, because a research proposal, we are again, we're, we're going to say, okay, how well does she understand uh, her field? And uh, how, how uh, sort of focused is she? Now, if you're being considered for a scholarship, they're going to give you an interview anyway, and you'll be able to talk through this more. So the research proposal does not have to be a full-fledged academic paper. It's just enough to show us that, let's say you are, you are serious about a P, as a potential PhD student. Uh, the scholarship, I mean, normally, basically, what most PhD students will apply, be applying for is either the uh, research scholarship or the PGF, which is an upgraded form of the research scholarship. You can go ahead and put both of those on your form. The application form asks several different things about possible scholarships. So, uh, you can pretty much put whatever you want on there, and then it will be up. The department usually does a bit of triage among applicants to decide which ones are, are better candidates for the PGF. Because the PGF is a bit more a prestigious scholarship, sometimes, let's say, if, if six students have all indicated PGF, but only three of them look like uh, good enough for that, then the department will only put up three, and the others might get an RS. Got it. And a quick follow up um, about the references. Um, uh, it, it sounds like academic references are always preferred, even yes. though the student might be ha might have been out of school for a few years. Yes, they are. Understood. Um, yeah. And for the for the deadline of those, um, uh, so the application deadlines first of November, and it sounds like um, the refer the references can send in the letters a bit later than that. A bit, yes, but you wouldn't you wouldn't want it to be too much later because in most cases, the the administ the con uh, consideration of the applications takes several weeks, 
And so you, and an application is not going, particularly from a student outside the school, an application is not going to be complete until the references get there. So although the references are not, at least in FAST, they don't have to be uh, due in by November 1st, you wouldn't want them to dawdle too long afterwards. Got it. And just a quick, quick follow up in terms of um, being out of school, um, even though, you know, it would have been like five years or six years, um, still, um, it's okay, or it's better yeah. in that case to get the older professors to yes. uh, for references. Yes, that's right. Oh, got it. Okay, thank you so much. Great. Thank, thank you. Um, I think that the next question in the Q&A box is actually for David um, about the MBA program. Oh, sorry, about the uh, PhD program in management, sorry. So the business school PhD programs um, are quite different across the different areas. And so to answer the question, it sort of depends on your background first to give an answer about like specialization and document required. So m and management organizations and the behavioral marketing people are effectively applied, so, uh, applied social psychologists. And so a background in that area and any documents that relate to that would go heavily towards um, getting admission to that, to those departments into their PhD program. Accounting and finance are very heavily economics oriented um, in terms of their focus. And so for them, documents relating to math skill set, like have you had have you had a calculus sequence? Have you had linear algebra? And, and things that show that type of, of background are quite important if you're applying in economics and finance. I mean, in finance and accounting. The same thing for DNO, uh, Department of, of Analytics and Operations. The except the, the sort of the hybrid one is strategy and policy. And they tend to take people from psychology, sociology, economics, history, you know, a wide variety of ones. And so they tend to be, for someone who's not really, who doesn't really have a strong specific one that they're already focused on, I would heavily encourage you to look at strategy and policy because they tend to be the more, you know, broad group as well. In terms of documents that you would need for them, they're going to want your undergraduate stuff. They're going to want some sort of test scores um, and they're going to want some sort of writing sample to show um, some sort of, of ability there. A big component of the PhD program is you're doing research and then you're writing that research up. And so the PhD program focuses on teaches you how to do the research, how to answer the questions and, and to pose the questions, but it doesn't really teach the writing component of as much. So if if you can demonstrate strong writing skills coming in, that can be a quite helpful. So any documentation related to that would be helpful. Great, uh, thanks very much, David. Um, there is a question by Artana about the printed copy of the application form. I'm actually checking with my colleague because I think that every, all applications are online now. So I'm not, I, I don't think there is a printed um, uh, requirement to send a printed copy of the application form, but um, I'll, I'll check it and get back to you shortly. I think certain documents like transcript may have, you may eventually need to set in a, send in a printed form. That would be a question to ask the, when, when the potential student is applying to the department, they will be in touch with a, um, a graduate administrator in that department who will handle the admissions and that person would be able to field that question. Yeah, great, thanks. And I think in those cases, as long as we receive the electronic um, you know, uh, application for uh, by the uh, November 1st deadline, uh, some of these supporting documents can be received shortly after. Um, so I think that that's usually not an issue. Um, great. Um, so I think, um, Alexa has a question about undergraduate transcript. Yeah, so I think that's related to, to the earlier question. I, I think as long as the um, application online is received by um, November 1st, some of these supporting documents can be received later. Um, Shelley has a question about ELL and whether it requires a GRE score. Um, 
Bruce, do you know? No, generally speaking, there are only one or two departments that require GRE scores and ELL is not one of them. At this point, we still do not use GRE scores very widely in the, uh, in the faculty because we don't find them particularly useful. So uh, only maybe two or three departments uh, require them. And so if it is, if, if a, de a department does require it, it will be indicated on that department's website in the, um, uh, in the specific graduate program applications. I would encourage all potential applicants to, to look both at the, at the graduate studies website, graduate programs section of the departmental website that they want to apply to, as well as the graduate study section of the faculty that they want to apply to. Because at least in FAS, you will find both general information uh, for the faculty and also specific information for the department. Yeah, so I would echo exactly what Bruce said, especially, you know, for, for any, any, any program really that you're interested in applying for. The program requirements do vary quite a bit across the different programs, so it would be hard to summarize them in this forum. But um, really, a lot of information is summarized online uh, with the individual uh, faculty specific and department specific pages. So I think it would be useful uh, for you to check quite carefully uh, what the uh, requirements are. Um, you know, whether it's GRE scores, TOEFL scores, um, you know, um, transcripts, so on and so forth. And most uh, departments and, and faculties will also have a kind of generic email grad help or grad studies help or something like that, that you can, and so assert, if, you, if you have questions that are not answered by the information on the website, then you can contact them. Right. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question by Justin about uh, submitting the application online and indicating the research scholarship rather than the presidential grad, uh, fellowship. So I'll take that question. Um, in general, once you uh, indicate that um, the NUS research scholarship, I think if, if you're a candidate that um, the faculty thinks is very, very strong for the presidential graduate fellowship, you will be nominated. Um, um, so uh, not to worry, um, that, 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 uh, that process is really kind of done uh, once the faculty has received the uh, faculties and departments have received the applications. Generally speaking, uh, we will always try to push candidates that we think are worthy for the pre presidential graduate fellowship um, uh, through that route. So, um, so that, that's, uh, that will be done um, uh, at the faculty and the school level. But the art, the research scholarship is the automatic default. So everybody would be considered for that to begin with automatically. And then uh, either you get put up for a PGF or not. And if you're not, you will still be at the RS level. That's right. Uh, great. So Ivy has a question, I think, for Rudy in particular. Uh, oh, is it? Um, so, sorry, no. Uh, so it's, I think if, if, if it says the applications are open from 1st November to 15th of March, um, it, it, it does it mean that the admissions are rolling? Is, is there a specific faculty or school that this question is uh, applied to, Ivy? Yeah, this person asked the question before, um, which I answered. So I think it's uh, relating to the Master of Urban Planning, if I'm not mistaken. Um, admissions are rolling in the sense that they um, would like to um, be able to review uh, admissions early and then inform people um, potentially um, early as well. So yes, in that sense, they, they would be rolling. There is another question from a um, person uh, from Beijing. Um, wish to understand if the EEL scores will have um, less advantage than uh, TOEFL, um, which was also um, initially addressed to me. Um, I would say that we do not make any distinction between um, EELs uh, and, and, and TOEFL. Um, so to my knowledge, there is no um, advantage in either one. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's very much a language requirement and it will depend on the program. So if a program accepts both TOEFL and IELTL scores, um, then th 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 there really is no sort of advantage uh, once you've demonstrated sufficient proficiency in, in, in the language. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, okay, uh, there's a question about research masters in political science and um, more generally, I think, sourcing for supervisors. So um, Bruce, would you like to take that, take that okay. question? Yes, sourcing for supervisors, uh, that is also a bit, um, a bit specific, that is a bit department specific because uh, in some departments, they may want you to have already been in touch with a supervisor and basically have one 
picked out by then. And in others, they will specifically tell you, no, we're going to look for a supervisor for you. So I, my broad advice to students on that is, is that in almost every case, if there is someone in the department that you are interested in uh, working with, it's good to get that person to get in touch with that person in advance. Simply because it's it's very common later when your application comes in, they may con they may talk to that colleague and ask them, you know, have you heard from the student? And so obviously, if they say that uh, I, yes, I have heard from this student then you are ahead, unless you happen to make a very bad impression by email, in which case you're going to be behind. Uh, but whether um, in most cases, I don't think departments, especially for master's departments, would not necessarily expect you to have confirmed one beforehand, but I think that getting in touch with one is a good idea. Thank you. Uh, there's a raised hand by uh, Yogita. Yogita, if, um, I've um, permitted, uh, I've, I've um, unmuted you. Um, feel free to ask your question live. Yeah, my name is Yogita Vora and it's regarding my son. My son, he his name is Dhruv Vora and he just graduated from uh, Narsi Mahdri Institute of Management Studies in Bachelor of Business Administration uh, in 2021. So I want him to uh, enroll in the master's program related to business management, marketing or sports management. These are the choices. So I wanted to know the more details about he want to, uh, he is interested in 2022 intake, mostly in January. So I wanted to know the details. I guess that's for me. Um, we don't have sports management in the business school, um, okay. but we do have marketing and management. We. Uh, okay. The both of them, so there would be three options, I would say. One would be an MBA, and the other two are MSc programs. The MBA program is, is usually for people who've already graduated and been out about five or six years and working, has work experience. The MSc programs are um, often take in people who have been out, who've just graduated or about to graduate or been out, say, one or two years at most. Yeah, um, I would say about three fourths of them to half, depending on the de degree, will have a major that's in that, and the other half will be from a variety of different ones. The cohort they take their classes in cohort fashion, and um, so they it's a lockstep program. You come in, and the first semester you take four classes, the second semester you take four classes, and then there's like a, a two class special term. Um, there's usually some so of internship. The marketing one is very quant oriented. It's more of a marketing analytics one. Mm -hmm. um, the MSc in management is a bit more broad based. So I think it depends on between those two, what you're more interested in, something that's a bit more broad based or something that's a bit more analytics based. Yeah, no, not in analytics, uh, only you can say management or business, he'll be more interested, but not in analytics, that is for sure. I wanted to know, like, uh, what is the el eligibility graduation, right, for this? I don't understand the question, I apologize. Yeah, the eligibility for this MSc course is bachelor's degree. Yes, yes, everyone has a bachelor's degree coming in. We will get in each of the programs, say there'll be roughly 800 applications and they'll take say 100 applications. We'll take 100 students out of there. So uh, the IELTS is also the requirement for this IELTS? I-E-L-T-S? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. I if it, A lot of it depends on whether one graduated from a university that's in English or not. If one graduated from a university with Trent, where the school is in English, um, there's not a requirement for that. If they graduate from a university where it, it's not in English, then there is a requirement for one of those two tests. All right. I wanted to know uh, like when he can apply for 2022 intakes in January or means January 2022 intake or he when apply is right the... now. Sorry? He can apply right now. Right now? Yep. Today. Today. So, uh, how he can apply? What I have to uh, give? What documents and all? How, I mean, where yeah. I have to submit? All of that will be detailed on the website. But basically, it's going to be in the standardized test, the undergraduate scores, 
um, mm -hmm. you know, undergraduate grades, whatever term you want to use for that. Um, that's the, the main focus on it, I'd say. Okay, so can I get the link for that where I can apply for him? Uh, yes, yeah, so let me let me look at it here. Great, um, thank you, Yogita. Um, I, in Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. In the interest of time, um, um, th thank you everyone for all the questions. It's it's been great. Um, there are a, a couple of remaining questions which I think we can take in the remaining you know couple of minutes. But I think that would sort of uh, bring us to the end of the discussion forum. Um, uh, um, if you have any other follow up questions, please feel free again, you know, to connect directly with the uh, faculties or the schools or also to email the NUS graduate school uh, email uh, for any clarification questions. Um, so I think the last couple of questions, um, one is for Rudy and sorry, one is for Rudy and the other is for uh, Bruce. So um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to them. And um, yeah, th thanks again for all the questions. Yes. Uh, um... Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Rudy. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, the first question by Yukas is on um, interested in, uh, has a background in architecture, but is interested in real estate or property development. Um, I would say that in that case, um, you know, we do have a Master of Urban Planning, which is offered um, in, in, in collaboration with the Department of Real Estate. But if really your focus is on real estate or property development, you should um, look at the um, massive programs offered by the Department of Real Estate. It used to be in the School of Design and Environment, but in the meantime, it has moved to the um, business school. Um, I'm not sure if David um, has more information about it, but that's where I would be um, looking for in your case. I don't have any more information, I'm sorry. They've moved in, they're on the same floor as me, but I just, they haven't fully integrated into our stuff yet. So I don't know the details of their program yet, I apologize. Okay, uh, do you want me to field the one from Ifan? Uh, PhD students, I'm not quite clear what you mean by sitting in, in, in an office or cubicles. I mean, basically, uh, your own, your time is your own, except for the time when you need to be teaching and doing office hours. And so uh, everything else will be uh, up to you. Um, <clears throat> then uh, accommodation options, there are online, uh, sorry, there are on-campus accommodations, which are uh, not cheap, uh, but, and many students coming in prefer to uh, make, to work out their own arrangements to uh, rent uh, flats or rooms with other graduate students elsewhere. So if you can get an online and if you can afford an on and can get an on campus one, it's great. Otherwise, uh, it's probably going to be a bit expensive. Great. Thank, thank you so much, Bruce. So yeah, it, uh, this sort of brings us to the end of the uh, discussion forum. Um, I would like to again, you know, once again, thank uh, everyone for participating. Um, there were lots and lots of questions. So I hope that, you know, um, um, that you guys found the um, answers to these questions useful. Again, um, there's a there's there's an entire day of programs, um, so I would really encourage you to sort of stick around to listen to the research talks to connect with the uh, um, with uh, the PhD. Uh, um, th there'll be a similar discussion forum um, among uh, with the graduate students. So some of these questions that you have uh, that you've posted to the vice deans and heads of departments, uh, some of these questions uh, uh, would be also very relevant to kind of uh, pose to uh, students who have graduated from our programs as well as our current students. So I would encourage you to attend those uh, forums as well. Um, before concluding, I would like to thank um, you know um, to thank very much the, um, um, the 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 panelists for sharing your experience and for taking time off to um, to to answer all these questions. Um, so thank you everyone, and I think with that um, I'll conclude the session. And um, the session with the um, eminent alumnus will begin shortly in about a couple of minutes. So uh, please uh, feel free to stick around for that too. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.